Differential equations is a subject that most people have a hard time with when they first encounter it. Let's help you understand it by considering some pretty basic examples. We will also look at some applications to motion. Number one says in part A, first find what's called a general solution of this differential equation. When you look at that equation that says dy dx equals 4x and we're also going to find a unique solution of what's called the corresponding initial value problem or IVP for short where not only do we have the differential equation dy dx equals 4x we also have what's called an initial condition a y of 0 equals 7. In part b we're going to do the same things for a different example. All right so the hard first thing that's difficult for people when they look at a different differential equation like this dy dx equals 4x is understanding what in the world it's about. What are they supposed to do? What does it mean? I find it helpful to imagine the differential equation is actually talking to. It's saying y is a function of x, first of all, in part a here. It's a function whose deriv derivative, dy dx, is always equal to 4x. That's just an indefinite integral problem, an antiderivative. If the right hand side were more complicated, perhaps involving both x and y, the independent and dependent variables, then it becomes a harder question. But for the right hand side, only depending on the independent variable, it's fairly simple. We're seeking a function that is an antiderivative of 4x. So to find it, we do an indefinite integral. We do an indefinite integral initially because we are after a general solution all possible functions that solve the differential equation. This is easy enough of an indefinite integral that you can do it pretty quickly without any fancy techniques. 2x squared plus c by a little bit of experimentation is seen to be a general solution. y equals 2x squared plus c. This represents infinitely many functions. One function for each of the infinitely many possible values of c. You can always check that this satisfies the differential equation. Its derivative with respect to x is always, no matter what c is, 4x plus 0, or just 4x. It satisfies the differential equation. If the right hand side had been, say, 4y instead, this would not work, because then you would be after a function whose derivative dy dx is always 4 times the function itself. y represents the function itself. And well, I'll give you a hint that that's an exponential function, but that's not one of our topics for this particular video. I'll let you think about that if you want. You should also realize that differential equations often have different notation. This is called Leibniz notation. You'll also see the differential equation written with just a plain prime notation, y prime equals 4x. It's understood when you write this that y is a function of whatever the independent variable is, in this case x. So once again, it can be solved by direct integration and you get the same answer. It probably would be less confusing if the differential equation was written with function notation, say as f prime of x equals 4x, and then when you integrate, you'd be finding f of x. That would be fine and probably less confusing, but it's not traditional. It's more traditional to either use Leibniz notation or just a plain prime notation with no function f that's specified. So let's now also solve this initial value problem where we add this initial condition y of 0 equals 7. What does this mean? It's understood that when I use parentheses like this, it's kind of like function notation. Y is represent, it's kind of abusive notation actually. Y is representing both the dependent variable and the function name here. It's saying Y of zero, when X is zero, you get an output of seven. So that means you need to replace in the general solution, Y with seven and X with zero to help you solve for C. Of course, zero squared is zero, two times zero is zero, zero plus C is C. Therefore, this is saying c must be 7, the same as the initial value of y. That's happening here in part a. It actually won't happen in part b. That c equals the same thing as the initial value of y. But it does here. So our unique solution of the initial value problem takes the general solution and replaces c, in this case with 7, to get y equals 2x squared plus 7. This function has a derivative always equal to 4x. And when x is 0, the output of this function is 7.
So it satisfies the initial value problem. Again, general solution represents infinitely many functions. Unique solution for an initial value problem represents just one function. Let's go on to part B. The first thing you notice in part B is that the independent variable name has changed from x to t. Is that OK? Sure, it's fine. Which variable should be used in general? It kind of depends on your application. If your independent variable represents, say, a distance, it's probably better to use x. Not that you have to, but more traditional to use x. On the other hand, if your independent variable represents time, then it's more natural to use a t. Though again, you don't have to, technically speaking. So the differential equation is dy dt equals sine of t over 2. All right, the right hand side just depends on the independent variable t. We're after a function whose derivative with respect to t is always equal to sine of t over 2. Once again, this is really a pure antiderivative problem. Again, if a y had been on the right side, it would be more complicated. There are techniques in special situations to solve such equations, but that's not our focus here. So just do an indefinite integral of sine of t over 2. That can be done by substitution. For example, you could let u equal t over 2. du would then be 1 half dt. dt would be 2 du. I won't bother. Through a little bit of guesswork, I just realized the answer is going to be negative 2 cosine of t over 2 plus c. Perhaps the most common mistake here is to forget that negative sign. The derivative of sine of t is cosine of t, but the derivative of cosine of t is negative sine of t. Because you have a positive sign of something here, you need a negative sign there. You also need the 2 to compensate for the fact that when you use the chain rule in differentiating this, you'll get an extra factor of 1 half. Check it on your own. You'll see that I'm right. The derivative of this is always equal to sine of t over 2. So there's a general solution. y equals negative 2 cosine of t over 2 plus c, where c can be any constant. All functions like this solve the differential equation. And in fact, any solution to the differential equation also can be written in this form. Now we also, once again, solve the initial value problem. Now y of 0 equals negative 3. Replace uh, y with negative 3. This is saying when the input t is 0, the output y is negative 3. Replace t with 0, get negative 2 cosine of 0 over 2 plus c. 0 over 2 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1, not 0. So this becomes negative 2 plus c. Now c is not the same as the initial value, negative 3. When I solve for c by adding 2 to both sides, negative 3 plus 2 is negative 1. And the unique solution of the initial value problem then becomes negative 2 cosine of t over 2 minus 1. And indeed, when you plug in t equals 0, you get negative 2 times cosine of 0 is 1 is negative 2. Minus 1 is negative 3. We are satisfying this initial condition. Problem 2 is somewhat similar to problem 1, but with some twists. In part A, we are to show that this function of x is a solution of the initial value problem dy dx equals, first of all, 1 minus x in parentheses times e to the negative x, and initial condition y of 0 equals 2. Part B, we're doing something similar for a function involving sine. Notice in part B, the right-hand side doesn't depend on the independent variable t. It depends on the dependent variable y. So it's a little trickier. Let's start with part A. We're trying to show this is a solution. This solution could be found by integrating this function, but we're given this possibility. So we don't actually have to do the integral. We just need to check that the derivative of this function always equals this. So go ahead and take the derivative of this. For x times e to the negative x, first we need the product rule. We will also need the chain rule. x times e to the negative x is a product. The first function, or left function, is x. The second function, or right function, is e to the negative x. The product rule can be imagined either as the derivative of the first times the second, plus the first function times the derivative of the second. Or if you prefer, lefty right plus righty left, where d means derivative. Left x 
dewrite the derivative of e to the negative x by the chain rule is e to the negative x times negative 1, right? Because the derivative of negative x is negative 1. Plus write e to the negative x, d left, the derivative of x is 1. That is the derivative of x e to the negative x. The derivative of 2 is 0. And pretty quickly we see by a little simplification and factoring out the common factor of e to the negative x that I will get 1 minus x times e to the negative x. I factored out the e to the negative x and I switch the order of these things. This negative 1 goes in front of the x, negative 1 times x becomes minus x. And that is the same as the right hand side. 1 minus x in parentheses times e to the negative x. We're done. We didn't have to actually do an integral. Now if you were going to do an integral of this, you could do some guessing to get this ultimately, maybe with a plus c there, or at least for the general solution, or you might use integration by parts, but it'd be a little tricky. So it's kind of nice to be told what the answer is ahead of time. We also want to satisfy the initial condition. We should check that as well. Plug x equals 0 into this equation. Get 0 times e to the negative 0 plus 2. e to the negative 0 is 1, but that doesn't matter because 0 times 1 is still 0. And yes, we are satisfying the initial condition when x is 0, y is 2. Part b, do the same kind of thing for y equals sine of 3t. Once again, I've gone to t as the independent variable. This initial value problem with this differential equation and that initial condition, there's also a little extra funny thing here. We're saying the interval specified is 0 to pi over 6. That seems kind of strange. Like, why would you have to do that? We will see why this is one good choice. It's not the only choice that could have been made for the interval. Let's see what happens. So what do I need to do? I need to, first of all, find the derivative of this proposed solution, dy dt. That's the left-hand side of the differential equation. The derivative of sine of 3t by the chain rule is positive 3 cosine of 3t. But wait a minute. That doesn't look like that, does it? Yeah, it doesn't. But that's because you're misunderstanding what you're supposed to do. You need to imagine the differential equation talking to you and saying, I'm after a function, d, y is a function of t, whose derivative is always equal to 3 times the square root of 1 minus the function y squared, where the function y is a function of t ultimately, even though you don't see a t there. It's OK. This is the way this kind of thing is done. So we need to take that right-hand side, 3 times the square root of 1 minus y squared, and replace y with the proposed solution sine of 3t, like this. Of course, it's more traditional to write that square as sine squared 3t, but you do need to understand what's going on there. You are really taking sine of 3t first and then squaring it. And I hope this makes you want to use a trigonometric identity, cos squared theta plus sine squared theta equals 1 no matter what theta is. So in particular, 1 minus sine squared theta always equals cos squared theta, no matter what theta is. In particular, if theta is 3t. So this becomes 3 square root of cos squared theta is 3t. So I replace the input there by 3t. And now it's tempting to say, hey, the square root of cos squared 3t is cos 3t. Well, careful. It's really the absolute value of cos 3t. The square root of a number squared is not the number itself, unless the number is greater than or equal to 0. But the number could be negative. So in general, you need absolute value signs. Check that with negative values of a. So in general, I need absolute value signs here. The cosine of 3t is playing the role of the a. Hmm. That's not quite the same as this, because there's no absolute value signs up here. Oh, unless cosine of 3t happens to be non-negative in, in value greater than or equal to 0, which will be true when t is between 0 and pi over 6. The cosine graph starts up at 1 and goes down to 0 when the input is pi over 2. Uh, t being pi over 6 will make this input 3 times t be pi over 2. So this will equal 3 cos of 3t went for t between 0 and pi over 6. Now, that's not the only interval that I could have chosen here. It just is one example of one interval. 
So we have that the left-hand side, the y dt simplifies to 3 cos 3t, three and the right-hand side, 3 times square root of 1 minus y squared, when y gets replaced by the function, ultimately simplifies to cos of 3 times cos of 3t as well. This does satisfy the differential equation. What about the initial condition, y of 0 equals 0? That's easy. Again, here's your proposed solution. y of 0 is going to be sine of 3 times 0 sine of 0 is 0. It does satisfy this initial condition. Number 3 starts our application section. It says a rock is thrown upwards from the top of a 200 meter tall cliff above a beach at 50 meters per second. I don't recommend doing this because you might hurt someone, including yourself. Falling under the influence of gravity, but no other forces. Is that re realistic? Well, no, technically there's air resistance, and there really is always air resistance when you've got, you're not in a vacuum. Uh, but maybe with a rock, it's negligible, maybe. Well, it's not quite true, but it's going to be our model. The acceleration due to gravity near the surface of the Earth is 9.8 meters per second per second. That is the units, also called meters per second squared. It's in the downward direction. Number of things to do here. Part A, how long does the rock take to reach its highest point? Part B, what is its maximum height? Part C, how long before the rock hits the beach? And part D, what is the velocity of the rock on impact? We will need some technology here to help us get approximate answers. All right. So do we need to draw a picture? Well, you sure you could. You don't have to really. So you're standing on top of a really tall cliff and down this is the cliff here. And the beach is way down here. And I guess that since it's a beach, there's also water over here. You're throwing it straight up pretty much. Well, OK, you better not throw it truly exactly straight up because you do want it to fall to the beach instead of right on top of your head. So um, it's not really straight up, but it's It'll simplify things if we pretend it's going straight up so we don't have to think about moving horizontally. Um, how do you solve this? Well, there's a couple ways you can approach it. One way is to not think about differential equations at all and just to use equations you may have learned in a physics class. But those equations themselves do depend on differential equations and Newton's laws. In particular, first of all, F equals equals ma, that's an f equals ma, that's Newton's second law. A, m is the mass, a is the acceleration, f is really the sum of all the forces, but we're only assuming there's a force due to gravity. But what is f in this case? What's that force due to gravity? Well, this takes a little bit of extra knowledge. It's proportional to the acceleration due to gravity. And the constant of proportionality happens to be the mass. And since I'm going to go ahead and take the upward direction to be the positive y direction, say, um, the force would actually have a negative sign since it points in the downward direction. So it would be negative m times g. That's proportional to the gravitation acceleration, constant of proportionality m or maybe really negative m because we want the downward direction to be the negative direction. This equals ma. a is the acceleration. That is a derivative. That is the derivative of the velocity. It's also the second derivative of the height. You could write this ultimately differential equation in a few different ways, either as what's called a first order differential equation involving a first derivative for the velocity, or a second order differential equation involving the second derivative of the height. Either way is OK. For the way we're going to ultimately solve this for the height, it's going to be a two-step process. So it's going to be simpler to focus on this equality first. It does simplify a little bit. The m's cancel. The mass itself doesn't matter. It could be a small rock. It could be a big rock. Actually, when you consider air resistance, the mass does matter, but we are ignoring air resistance. So we get ultimately dv dt, the derivative of the velocity, which is the acceleration, is negative g. g is the acceleration due to gravity. It's 9.8 meters per second squared. On some other planet or the moon, for example, g could be different. 
And in fact, technically, even G is different on the Earth. If you go to the top of a very, very large mountain, for example, G would be slightly smaller in magnitude, it turns out. But for the purposes of approximation, it's go ahead, good to go ahead and assume this is constant. This is, you don't see T's or V's on the right-hand side. You see a constant. Well, you could think of that as a function of T. This can be solved by just doing an indefinite integral with respect to T. T is time here, so I'm using that for the independent variable. V is going to be negative GT plus C. What is C? I need initial conditions. Do I have initial conditions? Do I have an initial velocity? Yeah, I do. It's thrown upward, thrown upward at 50 meters per second. That's a velocity, an initial velocity. By the way, we are ignoring the height of the person here. You could take that into consideration, but for simplification, we will not bother. When t is 0, v is 50. So we get 50 is negative g times 0 plus c, which is 0 plus c, which is c. c does end up being the initial velocity. So v is negative g t plus 50. Notice I haven't replaced g with 9.8 yet. I will do that, but I'm solving the more general case first. So that's the velocity. That can be used to figure out the answer to part A. How long does the rock take to reach its highest point? It's going to reach its highest point when the velocity is zero. You throw it up 50 meters per second straight in the air, and when it reaches the peak, at that moment in time, the velocity is going to be zero. So to solve part A, I'm going to set this equation equal to zero and solve for t. Subtract 50 from both sides, then divide both sides by negative g, and you'll get this. The negative signs cancel. You get 50 over g, which is 50 over 9.8. If you prefer that as an exact fraction, you could also write that as 500 over 98, or 250 over 49. Any of those are fine. This would be in seconds. Let's go ahead and approximate this as well. So we have 50 over 9.8. You could also check 250 over 49 is the same thing. This is approximately 5.1 seconds. Maybe you could say 5.102 seconds. That's probably too many uh, significant figures for the fact that we also have some air resistance. I'll just leave our approximate answer as 5.1. With this, how do you do part B? What is the maximum height? Now we need the height as a function of t as well. So I need to solve another differential equation, the other being differential equation being this one, that v equals negative gt plus 50. Well, where's the derivative? Well, it's v is a derivative. It's the derivative of the height with respect to t. It is dy dt. The right-hand side just depends on t. It can be solved by integration. y is the indefinite integral of negative gt plus 50. Integrate that, get negative g over 2 t squared. Maybe this is feeling familiar now if you know the equation for the height from your physics teacher. Negative g over 2 t squared, which will be negative 4.9 t squared plus 50 t plus c. c does turn out to be the initial height, which is the height of the cliff itself. y is 200 when t is 0. So I get this. And ultimately, c does equal the initial height. c is 200. So y is negative, I'll go ahead and replace g with 9.8 to get negative 4.9 t squared plus 50 t plus 200. To figure out when it reaches the highest point, plug in t equals 5.1. Let's go ahead and use the technology to approximate that. In fact, I'll just use more decimal places there negative 4.9 times the previous answer squared plus 50 times the previous answer from this plus 50 times the previous answer plus 200. You get about 327.55 meters. Maybe I should round that to just 327.6 or maybe even just 3.328. Let's go ahead and leave it like that. Part C, how long before the rock hits the beach? Find a value of t when y is 0. This is our height above the beach, not above the cliff. 
So I need to set that equal to zero, set y equal to zero, and solve for t. Use this equation, negative 4.9 t squared plus 50 t plus 200 equals zero. This is tailor-made for the quadratic formula. t is negative 50 plus or minus square root of 50 squared 2500 minus four times negative 4.9 times 200, right, for a c, I'm using the quadratic formula, over two times a, a is negative 4.9, so you get negative 50 over negative 9.8, which you already know is 5.1. Uh, go ahead and put that in there. Five point, positive 5.1 plus or minus uh, one over 9.8. The I could write minus or plus because that negative sign there, but it's the same thing anyway. Square root of what's all of this? Use a character technology again. 2500 ultimately plus because the two negative signs cancel plus 4 times 4.9 times 200 square root of 6420 that square root is approximately raise it to the 0.5 the power 80.125 divide by 9.8 get about 8.2 so we get 5.1 plus or minus 8.2 uh, one of those is negative, one's positive, we want the positive one. So add 5.1 to this. T is approximately 13.3 seconds for how long it takes to hit the ground. Right there. We're almost done. What is the velocity of the rock on impact? It's going downward, so it's technically a negative velocity. At this particular moment in time, v of 13.3, use the equation for the velocity, which is this, replacing g with 9.8, to get approximately negative 9.8 times 13.3 plus 50. I will go ahead and use more decimal places from the calculator, negative 9.8 times previous answer plus 50 gives you negative about negative 80.1 meters per second when it hits the ground. It's a negative velocity because it's going downward. If you asked after the speed, you take the absolute value of this and get positive 80.1 meters per second. Pretty fast. You get hit with a rock going that fast. It might kill you, okay? It's pretty bad. Number four is kind of a fun applied problem. A 727 jet needs to attain a speed of 200 mph, which means miles per hour, to take off. If it can accelerate from rest, zero miles per hour, to 200 miles per hour in 30 seconds, half a minute, how long must the runway be? Yikes, we gotta figure out how long the runway is gonna be? This sounds impossible. Well, it is possible if we assume a constant acceleration. But is that true? Is the acceleration really constant? I'm sure it's not constant, but we hope it's close enough to, to constant to give us a decent answer. And then in real life, you always give yourself some extra cushion anyway, just to play it safe. So this is still a good problem solving technique. Should we draw a picture? It doesn't matter, we can. I won't attempt to draw a plane. I'll just draw a dot for the plane. It's starting, say, at position zero at time zero with zero velocity, and moving to the right. We could let, for example, x be how far it's gone, though x would be a function of time. We are dealing with functions of time here. The acceleration would be the second derivative of x with respect to time. That, by definition, is the acceleration. It's also the first derivative of the velocity, because the velocity is the first derivative of the distance traveled. And that's a constant, but what is the constant? It's going to be the change in velocity divided by the change in time, or time elapsed. 200 minus zero is 200 miles per hour, which I'll write like this, divided by 30 seconds elapsed. This is the same as 20 over 3, or 6.6 .6 repeating miles per hour per second, but that's going to make more sense to convert to miles per hour per hour, say, miles per hour squared. So I should convert 30 seconds 
to how many hours? It would be one one hundred and twentieth of an of an hour, right? Because sixty seconds or one minute would be one sixtieth of, of an hour. Thirty seconds is half of that. One over one hundred twenty hours. Dividing by one over one hundred twenty is the same as multiplying by one hundred twenty. Two hundred times one hundred twenty is twenty four thousand miles per hour per hour or miles per hour squared. That is our constant acceleration where the units are consistent as far as time being always an hour so we get miles per hour squared here. And it's a differential equation and we can integrate once to find the velocity. The velocity is going to be the integral of 24,000 dt, that'll be 24,000 t plus c, but we are starting from rest. v of 0 is 0, so we get 0 is 0 plus c is c, so c must be 0. In fact, v is 24,000 times t. Okay, so that's the velocity how is this helpful? We need to figure out how far we're going to go before we reach a velocity of 200 miles per hour at t equals 1 120th of an hour. Yeah, I mean, if you divide 24,000 by 100, 1 over, uh, 120, you will get 200 miles per hour. It's all consistent. This is still a differential equation, too, that we can once again integrate x is going to be the integral of 24,000 t dt, that'll be 12,000 t squared plus c. At time 0, you haven't traveled any distance, x of 0 is 0, that'll be 0 plus c, so c is 0 here, x is going to be 12,000 t squared. So, the answer to the problem will be how far we've gone in 1 120th of an hour. 12,000 times 1 120th squared, which is the same as 12,000 over 120 squared. 120 squared is 14,400. 12,000 divided by 14,400 is 0.83 repeating, which is 5 sixths. What are the units? This is a unit of distance. This is going to be miles. So 5 sixths of a mile is how long the runway would need to be, but of course you want to give yourself extra cushion, so make it at least a mile long or maybe even a little longer. In our final problem, the acceleration is not constant. A car starts from rest at time t equals 0 and accelerates according to this function of t in meters per second squared for 12 seconds. How long does it take the car to go 100 meters? The previous question was you know, how far long does the runway need to be? This is a little different. We need to solve for t instead of a length x. But the picture is the same. This is now your car. Here you're traveling to the right. x is a function of t. The acceleration second derivative of x with respect to t, which is the same as the derivative of the velocity, is now not a constant, it's negative 0.6t plus 4. That function of t for the acceleration looks like this, and uh, I believe when t is 12 it would be about here. So you're accelerating with a positive acceleration first, meaning you're speeding up as you move to the right. Then the acceleration becomes negative meaning you're slowing down. Not that you're, you've turned around yet, but you're just slowing down. Okay, so that is going to be what the acceleration is. To find the velocity, we just integrate negative 0.6t plus 4 dt. That will give us negative 0.3t squared plus 4t plus c. Uh, it is starting from rest, so at time zero the initial velocity is zero. So zero is zero plus zero plus c, so c is zero. 
and we get a velocity of negative 0.3 t squared plus 4 t. We want to go 100 meters. We want x to be 100 and solve for t. We still need to solve for x. So once again, integrate. x is the integral of negative 0.3 t squared plus 4 t dt. That'll be negative 0.1 t cubed. Oh no, we're getting a cubic function. It's OK. It's OK. We'll still solve it. Plus 2t squared plus c. Uh, we are taking the initial position to be 0, uh, which is a natural thing to do. Could we pick something else besides 0? Yeah, but you're after really a distance traveled. so it. Um, you have to have time to go a certain distance traveled, so it's best to take the position to be 0 at time 0. That ultimately gives this c to also be 0. So your position as a function of time is x is negative 0.1 t cubed plus 2 t squared. We want to go 100 meters, find t. So we need to set this equal to 100 and solve that cubic equation, yikes. How can I solve a cubic equation? Well, I could maybe write it in standard form first. I could write negative 0.1 t cubed plus 2t squared minus 100 equals 0. I could maybe multiply everything by negative 10. This is equivalent to t cubed minus 20t squared plus 1,000. Solve that equation. OK, there, is, there are things you can do. Uh, to solve cubic equations, even without technology. Um, but let's just use technology here. So I'm going to go ahead and graph this cubic equation. Of course, in this calculator, it's got to use an x. I plug the function into the calculator here, x cubed minus 20x squared plus 1,000. Pick a window. Uh, this seems like it might be a decent window to start with. Let's go ahead and see the graph here. There's the graph. We see it's got actually two t-intercepts here. We would be after the first one uh, when t goes between 0 and 12. Let's go ahead and calculate that 0. Left bound and a right bound and a guess. In fact, t must be 10. It turns out to be a nice number. 10 seconds. You could always double check that maybe in this equation here. Let's just double check it even in our heads. 10 cubed is 1,000 times negative 0.1 is negative 100. 10 squared is 100 times 2 is 200. Negative 100 plus 200 is positive 100. Yes, this works. 10 seconds is the answer. That is how long it takes for the car to go 100 meters.